1950s F1 cars used all sorts of engines, from custom-built inline fours to pre-war V8s. The only regulations were a limit on engine displacement, 4.5 litres if it were naturally aspirated, and 1.5 litres if you fitted a supercharger. They produced around 425 horsepower, meaning they produced 94 horsepower per litre. Oh, and keep your eye on that number throughout this video. In 1954, they tightened the restrictions and only allowed 2.5 litre naturally aspirated engines, cutting power to 290 horsepower. However, the teams got creative with engine layouts and managed to keep efficiency comparatively high at 116 horsepower per litre. These were some of the best years for variety in F1. If you look through the grid, they were running inline fours and eights, V12s and 16s, and even a huge V-twin, something you normally only find on a motorcycle. However, all of them were incredibly heavy and they were fitted in the front of the car, meaning the cars produced huge understeer, forcing the drivers to neutralize this by mostly sliding around the corners. However, this was also the decade where F1 first used mid-mounted engines with the Cooper T43. This got rid of the massive understeer as they placed the center of gravity further back in the car, naturally making a more oversteery balance. Moving on to the 60s where the FIA were concerned about the speed of the cars as they were hitting over 180 miles an hour on the straights. And bear in mind the complete lack of crash protection in the car and the barriers were often hay bales. So the FIA brought in a limit of 1.5 litre engines, which initially only produced 150 horsepower. But this quickly increased to 250 over a couple of years, meaning about 170 horsepower per litre. They were incredibly underpowered, meaning road cars and GT cars of the time were much faster than F1. However, the lap time still came down over these years as it forced the teams to focus on suspension and aerodynamic factors. It was mainly V8s that were run, but teams began experimenting with wider V angles to place the engine lower in the car, improving handling. It was also the era where F1 first began using the engines as stressed members. This essentially made the engine part of the chassis rather than bolting it on top. Ferrari were the first to do this after inspiration from Lancia and it helped them save a lot of weight. In 66, the FIA gave back some power to the cars, seeking to be the fastest race series again. They increased the engines to 3.5 litres naturally aspirated or 1.5 litres if the air were compressed. The teams mainly used mid-mounted V8s that produced around 500 horsepower. However, some teams experimented with large inline fours and even a H16. Yeah, a H16. Probably the maddest engine in F1 history. BRM came up with the idea with essentially bolting together two V8s from the previous season. It made sense taking two very good 1.5 litre engines and making a 3 litre H16. However, it went down as a very ambitious but ultimately flawed engine. It used more fuel, needed way more oil, and it was so complicated and unreliable that it caused 27 retirements out of the 40 races it took part in. In the 70s, they found a better way of creating a low flat engine. They started playing with the idea of a 180 degree V12, essentially making a flat 12. This allowed them to mount the engine low, bring the center of gravity down, and clean up the airflow to the rear wing. As aerodynamics became a bigger and bigger part of the sport, engine power became a bigger issue too, as the cars began to produce much more drag. The regulations stayed pretty static through the 70s, with 3 litre naturally aspirated and 1.5 litre turbo engines allowed, and most of the teams were finding more success with naturally aspirated engines, until Renault came out with the 1.5 litre V6 in their RS01 in 1977, and it sparked off the incredible turbo era of F1. Initially, it produced 500 horsepower, but soon got up to around 700. It was a very experimental engine and it had some real issues. The incredible heat could cause some hot spots in the engine, and these had the potential to ignite the fuel prematurely and cause the engine to blow up, which was a fairly regular occurrence. So this was the point where F1 started using water injection to cool the block more evenly. Over the next few years, pretty much all the teams adopted a similar design, with some even beginning to use toluene to fuel the car. This exotic fuel combined with 5.5 bars of boost pressure meant that the cars could produce up to 1400 horsepower for about five laps before blowing up. So the teams would turn boost up for qualifying and just replace the engine for the race. It did mean they had to turn down the engines to last a full race distance, so they produced around 800 horsepower in this trim. This power combined with ground effect systems sent speed through the roof, meaning the sport became much more dangerous. And they were also notoriously difficult to drive as the turbine provided all of the power in one lump. 
F1 went turbo free in 1989 where they introduced the 3.5 litre naturally aspirated engine. It divided the field massively as they all had to build entirely new engines to meet the new regulations. They all followed a V format but disagreed on the correct number of cylinders. The Honda was the best of the bunch producing around 675 horsepower from a V10. You will notice this is the first era to have a lower horsepower per litre figure than the last. However, turbos were banned, exotic fuels were banned, and there were tighter regulations on how long the engines had to last. However, the turbo era had taught the team some valuable lessons. They had been developing engine components that used exotic materials like titanium and beryllium. These were needed for the insane forces produced by the turbo engines. However, now they could be used to reduce weight and allow higher revs. To make more power from a naturally aspirated engine, you typically need it to rev very high, but this comes with its own set of problems. Just think, as the engine revs faster, the valves also need to move faster, and the timing of this can get much tougher to control with a traditional camshaft system. So Honda used high pressure air to move the valves with much more accuracy. This is called pneumatic valve control and is a system that is still used today. And towards the end of the 90s, the engines got up to around 800 horsepower and were back to producing similar power numbers to the turbo cars that came in the 80s. The 2000s were where regulations were used extensively to control speed. From 1995, they used three litre naturally aspirated engines, as well as banning the exotic alloys that were extensively used in the 90s. The V10 was a formation that everyone landed on. It had similar power to the V12, but the reliability and lower fuel consumption of a V8. They produced around 900 horsepower, coming out to 300 horsepower per litre. Until in 2009 where KERS was introduced, Kinetic Energy Recovery System. It could regenerate energy from the rear brakes and deploy up to 80 horsepower for around 6 seconds a lap. It did come with a weight penalty though, so teams were fairly slow to adopt the system. However, it was really a test for 2014. These are essentially the rules we have today. 1.6 litre V6 engines with a single turbocharger. It came from a time where car manufacturers were producing more and more economical engines for their road cars, but still developing massive V8s for their F1 teams. So the FIA turned the team's attention to hybrid technology with the hope that it would trickle down to the road cars of the future. The cars have two regenerative systems, one harvesting energy from the turbo and one from the rear wheels during braking. This rear generator called the MGUK also doubles as a motor forming the power units we have today. The motor and engines work together to produce around a thousand horsepower. This is where the real efficiency of these engines show. They produce 625 horsepower per liter of displacement, more than any era of F1. And what's more amazing is that they do this whilst having the restrictions on fuel flow, rev limits, and the engines have to last a third of a season.